<laughs> now, unless you're brand new to the program, you've already heard me talk about microdosing and how it seems to have benefited all sorts of people. Well, tonight's show is sponsored by Microdose Gummies. Microdose Gummies deliver the perfect entry-level doses of THC and CBD for people who want to feel just the right amount of good without getting themselves high from just one microdose. And yeah, I mentioned THC. But before you tense up, keep in mind that microdose gummies are legal everywhere in the United States. Now these gummies were created for all-around wellness. I use them to calm my anxiety and to help fall asleep in the evening. But many people use them for pain, workout recovery, and even a creative boost. So what are you waiting for? Microdose is available nationwide. To learn more about microdosing THC, go to microdose.com and use code Monsters Among Us to get free shipping and 30% off your first order. Links can be found in the show notes. But again, that's microdose.com and code Monsters Among Us. As always, supporting our sponsors supports the show. So thank you for listening. Now back to that strange thing you caught on your doorbell camera. <laughs> if you've stumbled into just such a situation. And as I just said, my name is Derek Hayes. I'm a researcher, investigator, filmmaker, and humble podcast host. And I have for you this evening, per usual, a collection of terrifying tales told by the witnesses themselves. A collection of true tales. Now, each of the stories you're about to hear this evening was submitted to me via our 24-hour hotline. And as far as I know, these calls and the stories detailed within them are 100% genuine. And tonight, I not only have an amazing collection assembled, but I also have a carefully curated one prepared as well. Because tonight, we celebrate the launch of season number 15. And like we do with each and every brand new season, we're kicking it off with a special episode. Now, a few months back, I put a call out for paranormal investigator stories. Tales from researchers, tour guides, and students of the paranormal. And just like I thought they would, our audience came through and flooded the hotline with submissions. So without further delay, I welcome you back to the program. I welcome you to our seventh year. And I welcome you to tonight's special presentation. The season 15 premiere. The Paranormal Investigator Special. And to cut the red ribbon on this thing, we venture back to the land of my birth. Where David is waiting with his entry. Hello Derek, my name is David. I'm a documentary filmmaker and cryptid investigator. I live in Hudson, Ohio. However, this incident occurred in Hocking Hills, Ohio. On the morning of April 16, 2022, at 2 a.m., fellow cryptid investigators Richard Todd and I set out on a cryptid investigation. There was a full moon, but it was raining a little bit. Todd had parked the truck and we were outside the truck listening for sounds in the woods on the border of the Wayne National Forest. Just then, Richard said, Do you see those lights in the woods? 
Todd and I both looked, and we saw them. They were in the woods some distance away, and there appeared to be twenty or thirty or so. When I focused on a couple of them, I could see they were floating and moving around very slowly. They seemed to move by themselves. The lights were a bright white, thin rectangle, and gave a dimly lit colored glow around the tree branches as they moved. Now I've been in those same woods during the day, and there are no buildings or lights anywhere out there. After watching these lights for about a half hour, we decided to take a path back into the woods to try to get a better view of them. The three of us headed out. There was a full moon poking through the clouds, so we could see without our headlamps turned on. We saw the lights when we started on the trail, but as we hiked further into the woods, the forest became dark, almost as if the lights had turned themselves off. We looked in the direction of the lights and it was completely dark. Now we should have been able to see them better from our current vantage point. After about 30 minutes, we decided to walk back out of the woods. When we got back to the start of the trail, we could see the lights again. I began to focus on one light that seemed closer to me than the others. I could not tell how far away it was, but it seemed to be moving towards me slowly. I watched as the trees of the light reflected a dimly lit red glow as it moved directly towards me. The light floated and moved a little sideways and up and down. The light was coming straight towards me, and at that moment I felt like this light had an intelligence to it. And just then I felt a little bit uncomfortable and told Richard we needed to leave the woods. He agreed and we all three walked back to the truck. From there we observed the lights again. After watching for about 30 minutes, we decided to go further back into the woods and try to find these lights. We all three went in and walked even deeper into the woods and started to climb a hill. We wanted to get on the high ground and be able to look down into the valley to see the lights. When we got up the hill, we could not see any lights and the forest was completely dark. We waited there for about 45 minutes and then decided to head back out. On our way out, Todd said he saw some large dark shadows moving 40 feet or so off the trail, but Richard and I did not see that. When we got back to the beginning of the trail, we looked and saw the lights reappear. Frustrated, Todd suggested Richard and I stay here and watch the lights while he went back into the woods to investigate. He then left and disappeared into the darkness. I kept my eyes on a couple lights the whole time, as did Richard. The light was floating and moving slowly around. When Todd got back 30 minutes later, he said the woods were dark, and he saw nothing. We told him we could see the lights the whole time. Now it was about 5.30 a.m. We decided to call it a night. Now Richard has seen these lights before and has tried to investigate them, but has ran into the same issues. My questions are, what are these strange lights? Are they an intelligent life form? And what are they doing here? Well, that's my encounter with the strange Hocking Hills lights. I hope you can use my story in your podcast. I've included a link to a short video I posted. Thank you for all of your hard work, Derek. And I'm really excited to see your documentary on the Borrego Triangle when it's released. Take care. Thank you, David. So I grew up a little over an hour from this area. It's steep, hilly, holler-filled, tree-covered terrain. Ghost lights, or spook lights, most people call them. Mysterious, luminous objects that hover, flitter, and float above a specific, predetermined location. The Brown Mountain Lights, Michigan's Paulding Light, Missouri's Hornet Spook Light, and the Marfa Light of Texas are just a few well-known examples of this strange phenomena. And it's unknown what these lights might be. Skeptics claim them to be anything from headlights on a distant vehicle to a hiker's headlamp as they're out for a midnight jaunt. But believers assign other origins to these otherworldly oddities. Native American legends, train accidents, and other historical stories fill in the blanks left by these mysterious, luminous objects. And some of these legends can get pretty popular. It's not unusual to see an evening crowd gathered at any of these locations. Spectators of the supernatural, hoping for just a glimpse. But what David saw that evening back in April 
That particular light is not on my radar. Nor does it seem to be mentioned anywhere I do my typical research. In fact, when one thinks of the Hawking Hills area and its ties to the paranormal, another infamous story instantly comes to mind. Here's the official telling via the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. Go down the road just a little bit. Head over to Hocking Hill State Park. You've got the ghost of the old man himself, Richard Rowe, the old man of Old Man's Cave. He's still said to greet folks as you come down the steps from time to time with his two massive hound dogs that he kept down there. He died by a gun accident, cracking ice in the middle of the winter down below the cave. And it was actually his friends, the Wyandots, who discovered him and supposedly buried him somewhere near his beloved cave. The unfortunate part is the Wyandot never marked their graves, so we don't know exactly where Richard Rowe was buried. But they say if you listen on those full moon nights, you can still hear his hounds baying and they'll take you exactly to his grave location. As you can hear, there were no mysterious lights mentioned in these ghostly tales. So it's entirely possible that David stumbled upon something brand new to all of us. And if you'd like to follow David's adventure visually, I've provided a link to a video he did of this very investigation, found, of course, in the show notes at monstersamonguspodcast.com. And just because we've never heard of this one doesn't mean that Southern Ohio is without its known ghostly lights. No, there's a legend about a place that's said to be all kinds of popular. The Ghostly Biker of Buckley Road in Oxford, Ohio. It is well known that a drive on the roads surrounding Oxford can be dangerous. According to one legend, dangerous curves, oncoming traffic, speeders, and drunken drivers may not be the only things waiting for you on your trip. This tale begins with a young Oxford man riding his motorcycle on Oxford Milford Road. The man was in a hurry. He was going to propose to his girlfriend who lived on Earhart Road. But fate intervened before the cyclist arrived at his destination. Missing a sharp turn, the motorcycle flew off the road and the cyclist was decapitated by a barbed wire fence. It is said that the death did not deter our cyclist and that he is still today trying to reach his girlfriend's house to pop the question. In order to see him, you should drive to the girlfriend's old Earhart Road home, currently owned by a Mr. Falk, and park facing south. If you flash your headlights three times, you may see the headlight of the ghost motorcycle focusing straight ahead, only to disappear as it approaches the fatal curve. If by chance the cycle light does not appear, it is recommended that you drive quickly away in the opposite direction. Now that little tidbit courtesy of the Miami of Ohio alumni website. You know where to find the link. And speaking of Oxford, Ohio, tonight's next entry stems from that very location. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Bridget to the program. Hi Derek, my name is Bridget. I'm calling from your old stomping grounds, Toledo, Ohio. My story is for your paranormal investigator video, and I wanted to start off by saying your podcast is amazing. I love you so much, and I think your skepticism is your best quality. (laughs) It's awesome that you don't just, you know, take everything at face, you really delve into it and look for plausible explanations, which makes everything more realistic. So I love you, and I'm breaking the cardinal rule. I am calling in while I'm driving, but I'm going to project here. So hopefully you can hear what I'm saying. So my story takes place back in 2017. I was attending Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, and I was a member of the Individualized Studies Program at Miami, which was on Western Campus. And we invited a paranormal investigator to our program to give a presentation, followed by an actual investigation of one of the houses on campus that was said to be haunted that one of our members lived in. So this paranormal investigator is also a medium, which was very cool. She gave us a presentation with 
very compelling photos and audio recordings from her past investigations. And we were all so hyped up by this. Once the presentation was over, we headed over to the home that we were doing the paranormal investigation in. And when we got there, she split us into two groups and she gave us a tour of the house and asked us to make sure that if we sensed anything, felt anything weird or unusual or saw anything, that we take mental note of it, but that we do not share it out loud. So she's giving us the tour and she's touring with my group and we make it all the way through the house without any major happenings. And then we enter the basement. So the basement is straight out of a scary movie. It's unfinished, decrepit, almost like wet and damp looking and smelling. It was old and just kind of, I don't know, gnarly. So we get to the basement and we're walking around, you know, it's fine. Then we get to a section of the basement where the ceiling is a lot shorter than the other part of the basement. And for reference, I'm five foot two. So I'm not the tallest, but I still had to crouch down to get into this weird little offset kind of room situation. So we crouch down to get into this room and it it is so scary looking. There's a table, a wooden table that's built into the foundation of the cement floor that's been not cut in half, but it looks like it's just been ripped in half. And you can see all the jagged pointed splinters sticking up, just waiting for someone to fall on it and die a very painful death. So loved that. So I step foot into this small area. And the second I enter that room, I get lightheaded and feel almost like a like a dizziness just tingling on my head just it's weird right and so my initial inclination is to just you know think that it's in my head so i'm like is this actually something weird that's happening am i just feeling the spooky vibes and making it up i couldn't tell but i did notice it i took mental note right so that's the end of the tour we walk back out of that weird short room into the taller area of the basement and here she asks us if anybody experienced anything to raise their hand. And, you know, I was second guessing myself, but I just had this weird urge. And I was like, just who cares? Screw it. And I raised my hand and I was the only one that did. So I was like, oh, nice. <laughs> but she asked me to look to my program director and tell him what it was that I experienced when she leaves the room. So she left the room with another person that she told what she had experienced. So she's upstairs and I'm telling my program director, I don't know, man, I felt this weird kind of tingling on my head, like lightheadedness when we entered into that room, just kind of right at the entrance to the left. I don't know what it is, but that's kind of what I was feeling. Maybe it's in my head, maybe it's not. So she comes back into the room and then the people that we had told what we experienced say, you know, take turns saying what we had told them. And we both had experienced a similar feeling in the same spot in that short weird section of the basement so naturally my prize was to be the guinea pig for several tests one of which she had me stand in the room in the dark by myself thanks so much lady uh while she took a photo of me you know from behind just seeing if it, you know anything was picked up in the photograph from my understanding there was nothing later on picked up in that photo but there was something even more amazing that was picked up in an audio recording. So the next test that she had me do was she handed me two dowsing rods. They're L-shaped metal rods that you hold one in each hand and they might, you know, cross over each other or move and point at something while you're asking questions. It's a very bizarre thing. It was my first time using something like that. So she asked the 15 people that were with us to line up shoulder to shoulder and she wanted me to walk across in front of them while asking questions. So she fed me a question, which was, can you point to the person that has ripped jeans on? So holes in their jeans, they're ripped. So I'm slowly walking in front of the students and the rods start pointing to the chick that's wearing jeans with holes in them. And it's one thing when you watch someone do something like that. It's another thing when you're the one holding the rods and you know you're not moving them or doing anything that just makes it that much weirder. So I'm having a surreal experience 
But as soon as they point at her, they spin around and point right back, both of them, at me. And I'm like, okay. Then I look down and I realize, oh my God, that was such a dumb question because I too am wearing jeans that are ripped to shreds. And that's kind of confusing, but the ghost nailed it. So we're all impressed. But come to find out later on. So that wraps up. Nothing too crazy happens. We all leave for the night. And then a couple weeks later, my program director reaches out to me with an audio clip that was picked up during the time I was asking the dowsing rods or the ghost to point at the person with ripped jeans. So keep in mind that this ghost or, you know, this house was supposedly a part of the Underground Railroad. So in theory, this ghost would have been, I guess, an old, old timer, like uh, very much so a modest culture compared to what we have going on these days. So the audio only says one word, but it's very clear and it's epic. And well, she just calls me a whore. You just hear her saying whore while the rods are pointing back at me. And honestly, I feel like I should put that at the top of all my resumes when I'm handing them out. It's one of my proudest moments. <laughs> it's such a cool story. And I'm going to send you the audio as well when I get home. It's one of my only experiences I've ever had, but it's such a, a unique and interesting one that I had to share. And I really hope that this makes it to the podcast and that it is a good story to listen to. But thanks so much for all you do, Derek. I would say keep up the good work, but that sounds um, moderately patronizing. Just keep being the goat and thanks so much. Bye. True story. I once skipped a class in college to attend a paranormal presentation. One of the dorms on campus was holding. If I remember right, I'm pretty sure I had to sneak into that one as well. I have no regrets. Regardless of that, thank you, Bridget, for sharing your entry. And any time someone mentions an EVP and I have access to it, you know I'm going to play it. So let's do that right now. Played once, then isolated and repeated three times as I like to do. How does this light go off? Um, I think there's a switch at the top of the stairs. So that speed on paper can do it from there. Speed on paper can do it. Speed on paper can do it. Speed on paper can do it. Well, I guess I can hear that. Whatever they're saying, and whoever it is, they're certainly saying it with some conviction. It's obvious that someone there wasn't all that happy. Well, either way, a big thanks to you, Bridget, and to you, David, as well, for sharing your entries. Now, folks, you might be sitting there thinking, I have a true paranormal story that would be perfect for this program. Well, if that's you, give her hotline a call at 1-888-608-NIGHT. That's 888-608-NIGHT. Or record the story on your phone and shoot me the file at monstersamonguspodcast at gmail.com. And speaking of those entries, here's tonight's next one. All the way from the state of Georgia. Please welcome Zach to the program. Hey, Derek. This is Zach from Savannah, Georgia. This story actually happened in Milledgeville back in 2008. Me and my friends used to do some paranormal investigation because that's back when I started getting into it. And we actually went to an old insane asylum back in Milledgeville. And what we had found was we were doing some EVP sessions, taking pictures, you know, video camera, nothing too extravagant because we didn't have the money at the time this was college but at the end of one hallway we were on we were on the second floor you could see the window at the end of the hallway and it was barred you see some light coming through while while we were sitting there asking questions and stuff i noticed about 30 minutes in i looked over and the window was blotted out and i noticed that there was a figure and there was two beady red eyes 
and it was about maybe a hundred feet away from us or so. I mean, the window was about the size of six inches from where we were at. But this figure, I could see beady red eyes, and it was about almost to the ceiling. Well, at this point, my buddies had seen it, and they were like, dude, what is that? But at this point, I felt like it was time to get out of there because this thing was not nice. By that point, we turned around to leave, and one of the old type of wheelchairs come flinging past us, scared the crap out of us, and we took off running. Well, later on that, you know, a couple of weeks later, we were back in our dorm rooms, barracks, as you would call it, because we are part of Georgia Military College. A buddy of mine noticed that he had three scratches going up his back because things started happening in the dorm rooms and stuff like that, so we figured this thing had followed us back to the dorm rooms. Well, later on, at that point, I don't mess with demons. We went and found a priest, got blessed, and then ever since then, we haven't had anything happen like that. But that's one of my stories that happened, that it may have been a demon, may have been a malevolent spirit, something like that. But, uh, yeah, I hope you can use this and love your podcast and hope to hear it on the air and keep doing what you're doing, buddy. Appreciate it. Bye. Thank you, Zach. You know, it seems it's never a good sign when those red eyes appear. Nothing good has ever followed the phrase. And then I saw these bright red eyes. Well, not yet, anyway. And I suppose those are the perils of paranormal research. You put yourself in those positions to experience this strange activity. And you never really know exactly what you're getting yourself into. But we thank you, Zach, for sharing your adventure and your experience here with us tonight. Now, if you don't mind, I have a number of these entries I want to share with you this evening, so let's just jump right into the next one. Chris from Nevada. Please tell us what you experienced. Hey, Derek, this is Chris calling from Nevada. This one's for your Paranormal Investigators episode. All right, so uh, in 2019, I was part of a Paranormal Investigator group. You know, I'm not going to be too specific, of course, but, you know, anyway, we did a lot of things out there in Nevada. I got to tell you, there are some pretty amazing things. Definitely uh, a skeptical-minded person, generally speaking. However, I can guarantee you that with my time with that group, I did see and experience things that definitely defied explanation. The story I wanted to get into tonight is probably one of the weirdest things I'd ever experienced. It really shook me for days afterward because it was it was so much beyond what a normal paranormal experience was like. You know, we'd seen things move. We had the disembodied voices. All that was pretty normal. This was completely out of the realm of what I'd ever expected to have happen. So here's how it goes. We were at a pretty popular location. It's been seen on you know, several TV shows, so we were pretty lucky to get in there. And then actually that night, I was leading a group of people. I got booked for a kind of a private tour, if you will. So I had maybe five people, myself and another paranormal investigator, and we were kind of leading it, showing them, giving them a spooky experience. Since it was a private tour, the people there ended up getting pretty drunk. I was working, so obviously I was sober. Anyway, so, you know, they were, they were having a good time, you know, getting kind of spooked, and things weren't really too interesting. But as the night went on, you know, they, they got more and more kind of sleepy and zoned out. And anyway, we're sitting here in this room of, uh, you know, this, this location. It has a door to the room, and, and the door is leading to outside. And outside of it is a whole lot of nothing. You know, it's pretty much in the middle of nowhere. So this is going on. We're sitting there. We're not really getting anything too interesting. And as it went on, we hear this, this thwack at the door. Sounds like something hit the door. Uh, this is pretty common. Uh, usually there is, you know, reports of things being thrown at the door. So we go out there and check it out. There's nothing out there. Nobody, 
middle of the night, you know, pretty random to hear something like a rock hitting the door. Me and the other paranormal investigator, by the way, are the people investigating this. At this point, the other group of people were, were pretty much just sitting on a couch, zoned out. Anyway, we closed the door, and right there at our feet, inside of the room where we were just standing, is a rock. And it wasn't there before. Uh, and that, that was kind of trippy, because, you know, it, it was almost as if, you know, it sounded like the rock hit the door on the outside. And, you know, then, lo and behold, it's sitting there inside. So that that was kind of weird. We didn't worry about it too much. But, you know, we, we both agreed that was pretty odd. Then anyway, we're sitting there trying to get readings, trying to, you know, kind of stir things back up. And uh, similar situation, we hear a thud on the floor. And um, oh, that's really strange, you know. So we start looking around since that rock kind of came out of nowhere the first time. And uh, we don't see anything. And so I say, hey, you know what, we're sitting there. It, it was a bedroom kind of area. You say, hey, you know, check under the bed. Let's see if there's anything under there. And lo and behold, right there underneath the bed is a rock, uh, a different rock. And, and it was it was pretty obvious at that point that that was the, the source of the sound. You know, we ended up taking it, you know, and kind of dropping it from a similar, you know, height, it was like six inches, and the sound is pretty close. So, you know, it, it, saying it, it doesn't sound that, that odd, but it was really strange to be in a situation where it almost seemed like things were, you know, like physical properties of things weren't really making sense. You know, rocks shouldn't hit doors and sound like they bounce off and then end up on the other side of the door. And, you know, nothing was shaking that bed. I don't know anyone who would, you know, stick a rock underneath the bed and have it precariously fall off. It just None of it made any sense. But the place is, you know, allegedly very haunted. Like I said, anyway, you know, I'm a pretty skeptical guy. So, you know, we, we definitely, you know, vetted the place and none of it made any sense. It was really weird. So anyway, I think that was probably the strangest thing I've had happen. You know, I won't get into the other stories, but like I said, you know, I've, I've definitely talked to things that you couldn't see, you know, seen a lot of really anomalous stuff, but I've, I've never seen things disobey or at least appear to disobey physical laws before. And uh, it was after that that I, I, I just couldn't continue really doing a whole lot more of that. You know, frankly, I was really upset for about three days afterward. I couldn't get out of my mind, you know, what I'd experienced with trying to just make sense of, you know, things just appearing or, or even, you know, going through things is kind of what my mind chalked it up to. It was definitely the strangest thing I'd ever encountered. Uh, and I hope it's a little different than... You know, some of the other stories, uh, I'm sure you're going to have a lot of, you know, pretty interesting stuff. But, you know, again, I've never, ever experienced anything like that. And all the people that I've talked to about it, just no one's ever had an experience like that. So anyway, great show, longtime listener. Love what you do. Called in the past. I'll probably call again. Have a good one. Bye. Thank you, Chris. Now, typically, when one discusses rocks tossed from an unknown origin, you'd likely be discussing a Sasquatch encounter. After all, it's said they toss small pebbles to chase off intruders. But truth be told, none of this sounds anything like that sort of experience. But stones that pass through solid materials, well, that's a new one on me as well. Maybe a keen-eared listener out there picked up on one of the clues and can explain this little mystery to us. From time to time, a listener will have just the information we need to crack the case. And we dive into stuff like that over at our Patreon-exclusive show. Monsters Among Us Beyond. Access to that content is only $5 a month, and ad-free levels start at just $1. And over the break, I released an entire show dedicated to a Season 13, Episode 15 caller, who claimed he can see his surroundings even with his eyes closed. For that deep dive and much more, search for Monsters Among Us Podcast on Patreon.com or click the Patreon tab on our website. And new starting this season. So many of you have asked for it, so I decided to finally make it available. Over at Patreon, you can access a music-free version of each show for only one dollar a month. I'm not sure why anyone would want to, but if that's the way you like it, just like Burger King, you can have it your way. Anyway, 
as luck would have it. Our next caller is part of the Monsters Among Us family. If you frequent our popular Facebook group, you might recognize her as one of our awesome admins. Please take the time to welcome Sarah from California to the show. Hey Derek, this is Sarah from Southern California. This is for your Paranormal Investigator episode. So this takes place in Whitman, Massachusetts. And a little backstory before I get into my paranormal experience. So since a young age, I was always into the paranormal and the unknown. And my dad was as well. And that's something that we bonded over. Unfortunately, my dad did pass away in 2009 uh, from battling cancer. And once that happened, I fully dove into learning more about the paranormal as I was wondering if maybe that was some way I could communicate with him and find answers from beyond the grave, as they say. So I decided to get some paranormal equipment and then I decided to go to his grave with my mom and my brother and a friend at the time. I didn't expect to get anything, but I was going to try anyways. So I had a digital recorder device with me and I started doing an EVP session. Now the site was completely silent. A few cars passed here and there, but didn't add much sound to the recording. And one of the questions I did ask was, Dad, are you here with me? And then I went on to ask multiple other questions and nothing. So I went home, I put my digital recorder into my computer downloaded the file and enhanced the audio, listened back, not expecting anything. And I was shocked at what I heard. When I played it back, I heard when I asked the question, dad, are you here with me? I heard, and I'm sorry, I might get a little emotional here. Um, I heard in my dad's voice say, I love you, Sarah. And then you hear another spirit saying, hi. And then again, in my dad's voice saying, I'm here. And when I heard that, I was in complete shock. I could not believe it. And I honestly thought I was hearing things. So I quickly grabbed my mom and everybody around. And I said, please listen to this and tell me what you hear. I had everybody listen to it, multiple different people, and they all told me the same thing, that on that recording, it is my dad's voice, and he is saying that he loves me and that he is here. And I just could not believe it. And since that event, that has made me a true believer in the paranormal. And it's always going to be a treasured memory in my heart that I'll always remember and cherish. And I still do have that EVP recording. Unfortunately, it was lost on my old laptop, but I still have the digital recording device. So it's in storage. When I do find it, I will download it and I will send it to you so you can share it on your website. But that is one of the stories that really got me into the paranormal and to become a paranormal investigator was being able to hear that from my dad and get that comfort knowing that he is still here. And I have no way of explaining that because it it was his voice. It was no one else's voice. No one was talking during that time when we did the recording. And it was just amazing. I was so emotional. And to this day, I still have no words. And it was just an amazing moment. Now, I do have many, many more paranormal stories as I then became a paranormal investigator and went on many investigations. And like I mentioned, I've had many paranormal experiences throughout my life. So I will definitely call back and share more of those with you. So thanks again, Derek, for everything you do and all your hard work. And I'll talk to you soon. You know, not all of these stories are terrifying. Sometimes a touching tale can be just as mysterious. But we appreciate you calling in, Sarah. It's obvious telling that story is difficult for you. Now, as of the airing of the episode, Sarah has still not located that EVP. But if and when she does, I'll be sure to update the show notes to include it. I'd really like to hear it myself. So be sure to keep us posted there, Sarah. 
And you know, it seems like Sarah comes from a family of investigators. In fact, I received this entry from her mother, Joanne, also out of the state of California. Hi, Derek. This is Joanne, and this is my first time calling. I'm calling from California. I'm calling to relate stories for the Paranormal Investigators series. I'm calling with regards to stories that I like to share that took place on the USS Salem. The USS Salem is a heavy cruiser um, ship that was commissioned in 1949. And then 10 years later in 1959 was decommissioned. But that particular ship in 1953, there was a devastating earthquake on the Ionian Islands, which is off the west coast of Greece. It was called the Great Cephalonia Earthquake. And that particular year, that island had at least over 100 earthquakes that shook the region. And this particular earthquake in 1953 was a 7.3 on the Richter scale, and it caused untimely deaths of over 600 people at the time. So the ship was sent in as an emergency relief hospital where it had taken care of a lot of the burn victims, most of them fourth-degree burns, a lot of uh, locals who lost homes, so they took care of a lot of the homeless as well. But also on the ship, it also housed a lot of the dead. There was a morgue on the ship, quite a few levels down, that all of the dead were placed. So because there was so much death on board the ship, and again from a lot of people who died from their burns, was probably one of the main reasons, too, why there was a lot of activity on the ship. So one of the stories I want to share was a group of us had gone onto the ship before we actually became paranormal investigators. We went on a tour. And on that particular day, it was a summer night, we had all gone to the beach that day. There was probably about eight of us. And the boyfriend that I had at the time, his name is John, had burnt his feet severely on the beach that day. No lotion on his feet, so his feet got really sunburned. And when we had left, he was in a lot of pain, um, but he really wanted to go on this ghost tour, so he double socks, triple socks on and some boots on so that he could at least walk. And we were in one particular unit of the ship, which is what they called the burn unit. And that's where a lot of the burn victims were placed. And as the lead investigator was talking to us about the earthquake and and the devastating fires, all of a sudden John blurted out, oh my God, my feet, they feel so cool. I feel like I can dance and he's jumping up and down and he's dancing and he says, my feet, they don't burn. They feel so cool. And so Gary, who was the investigator, had noted that perhaps one of the nurses that was on board the ship noticed that his feet were burnt and immediately placed an ice pack or a cooling gel on his feet. And it was just the strangest thing because his feet were really bad and he really couldn't walk at the end of that day. But when we were in the ship and we were uh, in that burn room, he was just like jumping up and down and dancing around and stuff. So it was uh, an interesting little story that came out of that. Unfortunately, John had passed away last year. And so the stories that I'm going to call in and talk about had to do a lot with his experience. So in honor of John, I'd like to share these stories with this group because there's so many. There was instances of lost time when we were closing up the ship for the night after a tour and John had left 
this particular group that he was with because he was closing up some of the shafts of the ship and nobody could find him and, and it was just a loss of time and I'm going to share that story um, as well. And then there was an incident where we were going through the halls at, again after another um, ghost tour um, that had taken place and I turned around to see if John was behind me and he's slapping his face around in, in, in his body. And I said, what is going on? And he said he felt like he went right through a um, cobweb. And in fact, it was the spirit who went through him. So there's stories with that as well. And stories about um, a little boy, um, Philip, on the ship looking for his mom. And there's stories of, of doors, those heavy, heavy uh, ship doors that, that slam shut with no wind around. You could hear whistling, um, sailors whistling. So it was just very, very fascinating. And every time we did a tour, it was a lot of activity, a lot of stories to share. So I'll uh, call in at some other point and share those stories with you. Thanks, Eric. Hope you could use the story. And again, in honor of John, have a great night. Bye-bye. Thank you, Joanne. For more from Joanne and Sarah and the USS Salem, be sure to join us over on the Beyond After Show, where we will explore a few of those stories Joanne just teased. And I don't know what it is, but there's certainly something about those big ships, as we will learn further on in this episode. But until then, big thanks, Joanne and Sarah, for sharing those entries. Now, folks, a few months back, I put a call out for a new position here at Monsters Among Us headquarters, and well over 100 of you wrote in applying for the position, making the task of selecting just one applicant incredibly difficult. Tons of talented and incredible candidates made the choice even harder. So tough that we just couldn't decide. So Sarah and I opted to hire two separate candidates. So that said, I'm excited to welcome two new members to the MAU team, Delaney Bowers and Anna Parsons. Delaney is now working with me in development, production, and research, while Anna will help Sarah with marketing, sales, and social media. I cannot tell you how thrilled we are to have both of them here on board. With their help, we aim to find even more ways to deliver the spooky. So welcome, ladies. And if I may, allow me to take just a moment to thank the amazing applicants that took the time to write in. So many uber-talented people applied for the position. It was incredibly humbling. Now moving on. I believe I have time to sneak in one more before we have to go to break. So let's stay here in California. This time, visiting with Randy. Take it away, Randy. Hi, Derek. My name is Randy Evelos, and I'm from the California Bay Area. My experience as an EVP, I caught on May 6th at roughly about maybe 4 or 5 p.m. It was kind of hot, like a little bit of a breeze, nothing crazy that would uh, make any discrepancies in the recording that I made. And then what made me record was my newborn niece kept looking at these boxes that had a, a couple, like a shirt or some shorts on it. And so I tried my ripple effect from TikTok and got some pretty crazy stuff. So I decided to take out my my voice recorder on my phone and ask, is there any ghosts? If there is, can you speak in this? And then a little bit after that, there's a like a whispery of voice that I didn't hear at first. There was only me, my cousin, and his wife and the little baby outside. And you could hear them talking. And to be able to whisper into it, you would have to be pretty close, and there was nobody there to be there, to be that close. So, like, I, I don't know what I caught, but it's, I'm, I'm thinking it was a ghost. All right, that's all for my experience right now. I um, hope you can use this. Love the show, and uh, I'll be sending my the EVP I caught to your email as well. Thank you. 
keep going with this podcast. It's awesome. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, sir. And believe it or not, Randy actually did indeed send in his EVP. So I'm going to play it here. Now again, I'll play the clip in full, then isolate and repeat the part I believe is the anomaly three separate times. So here it is. Is there any ghost right here speaking to this? (laughs) Is that that box? No, it's a slurry quarter. Now, I certainly can't make out what's being said there, if anything. But if I had to guess, I'd say possibly speak, or maybe it's me. I'll play it once more so you can jump to your own conclusion. Is there any ghost right here speaking to this? <laughs> Is that that box? No, it's a slurry quarter. Well, it's chilling, whatever it is. And we thank you again, Randy, for taking the time to share it here with us. Now up next, we hear from a familiar voice. Wolf from Virginia has called in a number of times, making him something I like to call a repeat offender. Not that any of us are actually offended. Regardless, Wolf is back with a brand new adventure. Welcome to the program, Wolf. This is Wolf. I've called in a few times. I'm catching up with the podcast, and uh, you mentioned the season opener about paranormal investigations. And that's what this story is. It's a paranormal investigation story. I am a medium, and I did paranormal investigations for many years. And this took place about six years ago. It was on an Easter Sunday. I was with a friend of mine at the time and her cousin. Both of them are also sensitive. At the time, I was teaching my friend a little bit about how to use her skills as a medium. And she wanted to go look for Crybaby Bridge in Virginia. We both lived in Fredericksburg, Virginia at the time. And she wanted to go look for Crybaby Bridge which is not far from here, just a couple hours to the south. And we ended up getting lost, like majorly lost. We ended up in this little podunk town in Nottoway County or near Nottoway County, Virginia. And this was a small town. There was a white farmhouse on a two-lane highway that was the main thoroughfare through this town. It was a pretty clear day. And we decided to stop at this house and see what we just kind of see what we could find around this house and do a little bit of just a quick walk around the house, not in the house, but just walk around the front of the house, and maybe see what kind of vibes we could get off of this house. And boy, howdy, did we get some stuff off of this house. Her cousin and her decided to go running up onto the porch which I tried to warn them, I just got a really bad vibe, like they should not be doing that. They did. Her cousin kind of poked her head in through the screen door, which had been, part of the screen on the screen door had been removed. Now, there was no front door. There was only a screen door. And I don't know if the front door had been removed or what, but you could tell there had been a lot of urban exploration around this house. And we all got the vibe that there was something there, something in that house that did not like us there, did not like people in its house, around its house. And she poked her head in, kind of half stepped in and poked her head in and looked around. And I got a real bad vibe all of a sudden. She came out. And all of a sudden, we got this feeling, the three of us got this feeling. Remember, like I said, we were all mediums. We got this sense of this little girl that was very badly abused, emotionally, physically, sexually abused. 
by a father figure or something. I wish I was making this up, but this is, was really bizarre. And we looked up at the second level of this farmhouse, and second floor had, I think, four windows, three or four windows that faced the road. And the upper right window, far right window, we keyed in on that. And that was where this girl was. We just knew that was her room. And we're sitting there staring at this window for a long moment. And then our attention is kind of drawn for a split second. And then, or at least mine is. And I look back up there and my jaw just, I, I know I, mean, my, I know my jaw hit the ground. I mean, I was just in shock. There was a white head of an elderly man in horned rim glasses, balding, looking at us. And his head was kind of out of the window. The window was open and he was watching us we got this overwhelming sense of go the hell away, get off my property, get off my lawn to use the colloquialism. Overwhelming sense of doom and dread. And I look at my two friends and I said, do you guys see what I see? And they just go, yup. And I said, that's our clue to skidoo. It felt like an eternity that we were frozen in place just staring at this. It couldn't have been more than a few seconds, but it felt like an eternity. And I was standing over by the car, which was on the far left of the farmhouse. They were more to the right underneath of the window looking up at it. And I'm watching them walk across the lawn and I'm watching this full bodied head turn and follow them across the lawn and we got in the car and we left i remember we didn't really talk a whole lot on the way home but the conversation was about that i asked a few questions about you know kind of to, i kind of picked their brains a little bit about what they felt and told them what i felt and we did talk a little bit about it but we were all pretty much in shock. It was an extremely bizarre thing. And the two friends of mine that I had this little adventure with that I shared just now, since moved to Denver, Colorado, I believe it is, I lost contact with them. But I love your podcast. I listen to it all the time. And keep it spooky. Thanks, Wolf. Yep. A disembodied head will change the tone of any investigation. Every single time. That's something I've always stood by. And you know I'd be curious to know if any others had investigated or visited that particular location and experienced something similar to what Wolf reported. I'm not even sure how one would follow up on that sort of thing, but it certainly would be interesting. So if you have any insight, Wolf, be sure to update us. Otherwise, thanks again for sharing that experience. Now, folks, here's the part where I normally tell you to go buy a t-shirt or something from our shop. But truth be told, we're restocking everything as we speak here. So just wait a week or two. We're going to have a lot more options for you. So instead of advertising the shop, I'm going to advertise for some buddies that threw me a bone early on when we started this show. So check out this promo from my good friends over at Kryptonaut Podcast. Welcome to the Kryptonaut Podcast, hosted by Mark Stores, Chris Carnicelli, and Rob Morphy. The Kryptonaut Podcast is your irreverent and unwholesome guide through the weird side of the already wild world of paranormal lore. Covering an array of enigmatic entities from Octasquatch, Sam the Sandown Ghost Clown, and Jeff the Eighth Dimensional Mongoose. Bolstered by a roster of bizarre beings like the Loveland Frogmen, 
cosmic fairies, headless horrors, alien octopoids, carnivorous clouds, stick men, ultra-terrestrial space penguins, and flying fiends, including our notoriously in-depth six-part series on the legendary Mothman of Point Pleasant. Join us each week while we explore everything from cryptozoology, ufology, unsolved mysteries, conspiracies, and the occult. All while keeping a close eye on our reptilian overlords that dwell in the flat, hollow, robot-infested Earth. We are available at CryptonautPodcast.com and every major podcast platform including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube, where we also post weekly video shorts. This is the Kryptonaut Podcast. I love those guys. Now, a quick warning, though. If you have children, that may not be the best podcast to listen to in front of them. They're great guys, but they cuss like sailors. And that brings us to our closer. And this one takes us across the frigid North Atlantic. Kelly from the UK. Welcome to the program. Hi, Derek. It's Kelly in Warwickshire in the UK. I'm just ringing in for your paranormal investigations shout out. A number of years ago, I went on a ghost tour. Well, it was kind of a ghost hunt, paranormal investigation type of evening at a local well-known haunted property, which is called Guy's Cliff in Warwick. And if memory serves, my mum and my sister-in-law bought me tickets to that event for my 21st birthday, which is more than 20 years ago now. So I apologise if my memory is a little bit vague. But basically, Guy's Cliff is a big, big old house, and I think there was a fire there a number of years ago. So when we went, it was inaccessible. So on the back of the house, there's kind of a big building which has a coach house on one side, and then on the other side, there's there's like a big old chapel. And the building that the chapel's in, it, it is quite a large building. On one side, There are kind of offices and, you know, little rooms upstairs and little rooms downstairs. And then in the middle, there's the actual chapel. And then on the other side of the chapel, there's like um, kind of a side room with a big... I should have looked this up before I started recording, but um, it's like a big stone table. And I don't know if you would call it like an altar or, or something like that, but it's like a great big marble table on a pedestal. And so we were with a group of five or six people that we'd never met. So I don't know what any of the background was on those people. But we all did a seance in that side room with our fingertips on that big stone table. And we were asking kind of yes, no questions. Sort of, you know, were you local? And uh, what you can't really ask what somebody's name is when you're asking yes, no questions. But, you know, were you local? Are you a man or a woman? That kind of thing. And it said he wasn't local and it was a man. So somebody went and fetched a Ouija board and we set that up on this. I'm going to call it an altar. I don't know if it was. But anyway, so we set up this Ouija board and we asked what his name was. And his name, what was spelled out, was Percy. And we asked him, did he die locally? You know, was he from around here? And he said no. And when we said, how did you die? He spelled out the word Titanic. And we asked him, were you first class or second class on the Titanic? I think there was a third class actually as well. But he said second class musician. And then we did continue to ask questions, but nothing else really came through. It just sort of wobbled around a bit and then the planchette went to the word goodbye. So on getting home, it was about four o'clock in the morning, but I did Google it. And it turned out that there was a musician on the Titanic who was called Percy. I've never really given it much thought since that happened because, you know, what's a guy from the Titanic who was born in London, according to Wikipedia, doing a seance in Warwickshire? And never gave it a second thought but when you were talking about paranormal investigations and wanting people to ring in i've just googled today the musicians from the titanic and i found an article which said that basically everybody who was listed as a musician on the titanic except for percy taylor 
you know, like there were obituaries, there were memorials, there's this big history that's been published over and over, um, sort of declaring them the heroes of the day because they accepted their fate and, you know, they played on anyway. But this one guy, Percy Taylor, he was listed as being a second cellist in that five-piece band. And actually, what the historians are suggesting is that there would never be two cellists. One would be a cellist and the second would be a viola player. And so they think that because there is no real history on Percy Taylor, the reason for that might be that the viola player was kind of you know, like the guy in the background that just plunked on the odd note here and there and he wasn't, you know, this this amazing presence in a small five-piece band. He was kind of the the guy that sat on the sidelines. And the article that I've just read, it, it suggested that it's a real shame, and I would agree, actually, that this viola player, I believe that he was estranged from his wife. And so after the whole Titanic incident she didn't want to talk to the press and she didn't want to you know share his life history or talk about him as this this hero she just kept silent and didn't divulge anything about him really so he's kind of a bit of a mystery so the article suggests that the viola playing community and musicians in general should kind of accept him as one of their own and and kind of honour him and maybe make sure that he does get that memorial because he wasn't honoured in the same way as the others. But anyway, I'll send you a link to that article. But yeah, that was the one and only time I've ever done a paranormal investigation. Thank you, Kelly. Incredible. That story certainly caught my attention. And I told you Joanne's wasn't the last ship we'd explore this evening. And Kelly certainly isn't messing around. Coming in with the Titanic disaster. It's likely the most infamous shipwreck in the history of the English-speaking world. The tragedy still has people gripped some 111 years later. And you know, all this Titanic talk got me wondering... Given the shock of the loss of an unsinkable ship, the fact that 1,503 people died, and the overall human connection of the disaster, there are, of course, legends and stories in place of strange paranormal activity associated with the Titanic. But nothing compares to the experience of being aboard the ship itself. Now, I had initially planned on featuring a few ghost stories loosely associated with the ill-fated luxury liner. Stories of the ship's captain, Edward Smith, haunting his childhood home, or crashing current-day ship tours in the area. But having sifted through hours of Titanic-related news stories, documentaries, and interviews with the survivors themselves, those stories began to resonate with me. And don't worry if you want to hear more about the ghostly side of all of this. I've linked to an interesting YouTube video that neatly covers a lot of the paranormal activity associated with the vessel. Along with the link that Kelly provided. You know where. Over in the show notes. But to be honest, what I found more haunting were the stories of survival I'd heard from first-hand witnesses. Experiencers. Survivors of which there were a few in contrast. 2,240 souls were aboard when the ship struck an iceberg in the icy black waters of the North Atlantic. When the collision occurred, many of the passengers were assured there was no danger present and thus returned to their rooms. Three hours later, the pride of the White Star Line lay in pieces at the bottom of the sea. 1,517 men, women, and children lost their lives that evening. Some drowned when the ship pulled them under, others freezing to death as they bobbed on the surface, waiting for salvation. And that help did arrive, however, hours too late. Only a handful of the hundreds that were spilled into the water were alive when they were finally retrieved. 
But you know, the crew took the biggest hit of all. Crew members, including people like Piercy Taylor. Some 700 crew members expired that night, right along with her. But in my research, I stumbled upon a survival story that seemed to beat all the odds. The survivor was not only a crew member, but he was also plucked from the frigid waters and lived to tell the tale. Now, I found his story so compelling that I decided to call an audible and share it here this evening, despite the fact that there's absolutely nothing paranormal about it. It's just an incredible story of human survival. Frank Winold Prentice was a 23-year-old storekeeper aboard the ship when it sank. The following is his account, in his own words, courtesy of a 1979 BBC interview. No impact as such. It was just like jamming your brakes on a car. And uh, that was that. She stopped. We had a porthole open, and I looked out, and the sky was clear, the stars were shining, the sea was dead calm. And I thought, I don't know, I couldn't understand it. So I came out of my cabin and I thought, well, I'd go forward. And I went forward to the well deck on the starboard side and I could see ice in the well deck. There's no sign of iceberg then because he'd passed us. And the lights were shining on the water from the portholes and the, no sign of damage above water line. And of course, what had happened, we'd slipped over the iceberg. And although she was supposed to be unsinkable with a double bottom, the iceberg had cut her from forward on the starboard side to the engine room, right through her two bottoms. And we had orders to get the lifeboats out. And because the order, the same old order, women and children, and we swung the lifeboats out and gradually filled them up. First boats were away on the port side. The first boats away didn't have many passengers on board. They were afraid to go down. There was a 70-foot drop to the water, and they didn't think she was going to sink. And a few of the first boats on the port side got away with half-filled. Don't forget, we had 16 lifeboats, and uh, they each carried 50. And if they'd been filled, we could have saved 800, whereas we only saved 500. So you can imagine there were many seats in the first lifeboats, vacant. Um, then I had orders to uh, go down the storeroom with a gang of men and get all the biscuits we could find. Well, when we got back up onto the boat deck, we couldn't get near the lifeboats. Some people were scrambling to get in and being pushed back. By that time, she was listing very badly to port and we couldn't get the starboard boots down. But before I got my life belt on, I met a, a young couple, and uh, I can tell you her name, it was a Mrs. Clark. They'd spent their honeymoon in France, and we'd picked them up at Cherbourg, and uh, she, she was having trouble with her life belt. So I fixed that on to her, and I said, I think you'd better get into a lifeboat, and there was one in the port on the port side. So she said, no, she said, I don't want to go there. I don't want to leave my husband. So I said, well, it's just precautionary measure. You get in, your husband will follow later on. And I got her away, and that was that. And then I picked up my own life belt and put it on. Then the third class passengers were coming up. There were 700 of them. And they swarmed the decks and filled up the decks. And I thought, well, I'd done all I possibly could. I'd helped them all I could. And I thought, oh, now I'll uh, go up and get out of all this scrumming and go on the poop deck. And she was sinking fast then. And all of a sudden she lifted up quickly and you could hear everything crashing through her. Everything that was movable was going through her. And then she went down and seemed to come up again. So I thought, well, now I'm going to leave. And uh, 
I was hanging on to a board. We had two boards, stab and port, which said, keep clear of propeller blades. And I was hanging on to one of these and I was getting higher and higher in the air. And I thought, well, now I'll go. And I dropped in. I had a light built on. And I hit the water with a terrific crack. And luckily, I didn't hit anything when I dropped in. There were bodies all over the place. And then I looked up at the Titanic. So the propellers were right out of water. The rudder was right out and I could see the bottom. And then gradually she glided away, and that was that. That was the last of the Titanic. I didn't want to die, I mean, and I didn't see much chance of living, but I was gradually getting frozen up. And um, by the grace of God, I came across a lifeboat, and they pulled me in. And there was a fireman dead in the bottom, and there was about a foot of water in this boat. There were um, there was another man who, try, who was trying to he seemed to be trying to get away from it again. I don't know what was the matter with him. They were tying tying him down, and the rest were women and children. And I I sat on a seat, and uh, who should be I sat next to Mrs. Clark, the the, the girl I'd put into a lifeboat, and she said uh, the first thing she said, "Where's my have I seen my have you seen my husband?" So I said, no, I haven't, but I expect he'll be all right. Anyway, I was pretty in a pretty bad way then, as you can imagine, frozen solid almost. And she wrapped me round with a cloak. She had some sort of blanket or a coat on. Anyway, I think uh, she probably saved my life, I don't know. But uh, I saved hers. At least I think I might have done. I think I did. And she saved mine. Then, first light, the uh, Carpathia came along. The Carpathia was about 7,000 tons, and they were going to the Mediterranean, absolutely loaded. And uh, they took us all on board, took us to New York. And that was that. I believe you've even got a watch that you were wearing at the time when you went into the water. Yes, yes, but uh, I couldn't afford anything better in those early days. Here it is. That says 20 past two. What time was it when you went into the water, do you think? I think about two o'clock. I think it lasted. It was frozen up like I was. I think it lasted for about 20 minutes in the water. Does talking about this incident bother you like you have been today? Talking about it? I should probably dream of that tonight. Have another nightmare. <laughs> You'd think I'm too old for that, but you'd be amazed. You lie in bed at night and the whole thing comes round again. Frank passed away on May 30th, 1982. And the song that you're hearing now, Near My God to Thee, is the same song that those 2,240 passengers heard that night as the world's largest ship sank beneath the glassy water. Some heard it as they watched loved ones perish, while others slipped beyond the veil with this haunting melody flooding their ears. And it's music that was only made possible by the brave musicians of the Titanic, who accepted their fate and continued to play until the ship's hull rose hundreds of feet out of the Atlantic, spilling the band, Piercy Taylor, Frank Prentice, and hundreds of others into the frigid waters below. And I know there's a ton of pop culture surrounding this tragedy. The Cameron film alone may be more famous than the ship itself. But you know it's not until you look at this disaster on a personal level that you realize what these people actually went through. And as heartbreaking as this little deep dive was, and thank you, Kelly, for sending me on it. 
and although Frank is now gone, I must say it's a pleasure to do my part to help share his heroic story. And that, folks, is going to do it for this episode. Monsters Among Us was written and produced by me, Derek Hayes. Additional support is provided by Sarah Carter Hayes, Delaney Bowers, Anna Parsons, and Addie Lloyd. All media used in this production is done so under the protection of fair use. Follow the show on social media. And while you're at it, please leave us a rate and review wherever that sort of thing is possible. And finally, the terrifying score you heard this evening. Well, it's Iron Cthulhu Apocalypse, Co.ag Music, and Carl Casey at White Bat Audio. Thank you so much for tuning in. Y'all keep it spooky out there. And I'll catch you back here next week. Have a good night. I know there's been a lot of announcements and advertisements and that sort of thing in this episode, and I do apologize for that. But you see, we've been gone for six weeks, and there's a lot of information we need to catch you up on. Besides, I have some exciting news. You can now listen to Monsters Among Us episodes every Tuesday and Thursday evening at 9 p.m. Eastern on the 24-7 paranormal radio station Sundown 96.6. You can tune in at sundown966.com. And while you're there, be sure to check out the rest of their spooky schedule. They're streaming this scary round the clock. Now, if you're new to the show, and lately there are a lot of you, we do something a little weird here. For those of you old enough to remember, do you recall when you bought a new CD, say you bought the latest Creed album, or Chumbawamba, or something, and you listened all the way through? But the CD doesn't immediately start back over. Now instead, after a short pause, a bonus track will begin to play. A hidden track, only for those patient enough to find it. Well, that's how we do it here as well. A bonus secret story, just for you. And tonight's is a strange one that will make each of you wonder just what the hell was going on there. So here with that entry is Justin from the state of Pennsylvania. Hey, Derek, this is Justin, the firefighter. I called, I think, a season or two ago about the dead guy following me around. But this is for the paranormal investigator, I guess. This happened whenever I was, I was pretty young. I was probably 13 or 14 at the time, maybe a little, maybe a little older, maybe 16-ish. The town I grew up in, you know, you have them people that move in and then move out. I mean, they live there a couple of years that you remember from your childhood, stuff like that. Well, these people that this happened with were just those type of people. They moved in. They only lived there in the town or around the town for maybe a year or two and then moved out. And I never heard, seen, talked to them ever again. So it's probably one of my first times ever doing anything spooky, ghost hunting, you know, that type of stuff. Trespassing. Of course, we were trespassing because we were young and dumb. But so we broke into this abandoned house. We didn't break in. There wasn't a door. We walked in this abandoned house that was on this old back road in our town. And uh, I remember the guy's name was James and the girl's name was Tina, I think. And we, well, I don't want to say we, they brought a Ouija board, and I guess they were, we were going to, you know, 
we didn't know what we were doing. We were just kind of all hanging out, walking around, just bored. So they bring us Ouija board. We go into this abandoned house. They're, you know, doing spirit stuff, blah, 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 blah. I don't, I don't even think anything even happened. It's not really, I really can't remember. It's been so long. It's almost 16 years now. But the weird part was, so after we do the, you know, ghost hunting and we're all getting ready to leave, this guy, it was like a boyfriend and girlfriend that, you know, the ones that moved out of town and stuff. And they were a little weird. The guy was a little weird. He was that, like, ring-wearing trench coat type of dude. You know what I mean? Like, trench coats were cool. That guy with the slick back hair, short, you know. So, yeah, we go to walk out of the house. Like, we're done. We're getting out of there. Like, whatever. Go find something else to do. It was pretty late, too. It was, like, probably around 9, 10 o'clock. And, you know, the way we grew up, it's not normal for us to be out that late. And so uh, we're going to leave. We walk out. And every one, there's, like, five of us, like, three of me and my buddies, like, close friends that I grew up with. And then, like, the couple and one of their buddies and we're walking out and as we're walking out this guy every person that walked out it was like a line like okay step up and then before he walked out he, he put his hands on your chest and back standing on the left of me he put his hands on, his, on my chest and my back and he like puts his head down almost like he's praying and he starts saying these words and mumbling I don't know it sounded like gibberish to me I don't I, I, as far as I remember but I remember when he did it and he was pressing a little firm and I remember when he did it, it was almost like a warm sensation. Like, you know, whenever you, you're having a few drinks, you start getting a little tipsy. That warm sensation comes over you. It was like that, a pulsating warm sensation. And it was very quick. It didn't last long. But I was freaked out, man. Like, after he did that, I was freaked out. I was like, whoa, that was weird. And, and nothing was really said. Like, he did it, everybody walked out. And he's like, okay, let's go. So, you know, we start walking down the road. They go our way. Uh, they go their way. We go our way. And, uh, yeah, and I didn't think about it for years. I mean, yeah, it was weird, you know. But I've been thinking about it a lot more lately. Knowing what I know now, you know, I'm, I'm into the paranormal and listening to these shows and uh, Bigfoot and all that. I, I You know, ghost hunting, uh, UFOs, love it all. I'm very into it. I would even say enthusiast. I do my own ghost hunts and stuff. And, uh, yeah, man, I, I just think more and more, I wish I would have known what he did because it almost makes me think is my life of kind of being connected to the paranormal, the whole story I told before about the dead guy following me around from the fire department. And, and was, was it maybe because of this event? Did he attach something to me? Was it dark? Was it good? Was it, magic or whatever you want to call it and the occult i don't know um if anybody has any insight knows anything about this stuff it would be nice to know is there something i can do to maybe kind of just reassure that nothing's attached to me all these years just kind of give myself a blessing or, or anything any any insight would be greatly appreciated but uh yeah as usual love the show i will call back with more uh yeah man thanks Thank you, Justin. What do you guys think? Was that guy a healer of some sort? Was he simply laying on of hands? Or was he just trying to freak people out? Regardless of the intent, we thoroughly enjoyed the story. So thank you again, Justin, for calling it in. Well, now it's that time of the evening where we shift gears a bit. We slip into something a little more comfortable. Which for me is a softer flannel shirt than the one I had on before. And we do all that because from here on out, we're going beyond. It's time for the after show. Now if you want access to the back half of this episode, where I still have a few paranormal investigator stories to share with you, join our Patreon campaign. Simply visit our website at monstersamonguspodcast.com and click that Patreon tab. A $5 monthly pledge will get you access to this bonus content and literally days worth of the back catalog. So visit patreon.com and search us out or hit up our website. But either way, I hope to see you there. Now to get this thing started, 
were headed out to the desert. Arizona, to be exact. Welcome to the beyond, mystery caller. Hi, Derek. This is for your paranormal investigator stories. So this took place, I want to say, in the mid-90s. Um, so you're never too young to start paranormal investigating, I think. At the time, we lived in a, a small trailer park, and we had a maintenance man that had just moved out of the community. And me and my sisters had heard, I don't remember how, but we had heard that his trailer was haunted. So we got together, me, my two sisters, my best friend, and two other girls from the community. 